a 10-year mystery, one of the most high-profile, baffling cases this century. It just completely eats into you all the time. A father, a mother, closest friends devastated as 35-year-old chef Claudia Lawrence walks across CCTV screens out of their lives. It's just confirmed that I'm, I'm, I'm a rubbish friend. I couldn't find. A firestorm in the media. I just thought, shit. Blowing the inquiry off course. This is not the way I wanted it to go at all. Police facing a wall of silence. It did seem sometimes as if a mist had been created enveloping the murder investigation that, that covered up the truth. North Yorkshire Police have taken a lot of criticism over the investigation. So did Claudia come to harm? Claudia's phone was deliberately switched off. Was it an abductor? Or could she be alive overseas? One of the theories was that she'd uh, left the UK in a van and been brought across to Cyprus, uh, smuggled into the country. Never before broadcast testimony about a mystery lover two nights before the disappearance. She'd been out with a male friend the evening and uh, things progressed. Her body has never been found. I think as a mum, I'd feel a cut off here. Until we get the knock on the door, I still have hope. So is Claudia Lawrence missing or murdered? York, Friday, March the 20th, 2009. Peter Lawrence approaches the home of his 35-year-old daughter, Claudia. I had a telephone call from Susie, one of Claudia's best friends, and uh, she was very concerned that she hadn't been able to contact Claudia. I was extremely worried because Claudia is always constantly in touch with her friends. And it's very unlike her uh, not to be. The previous night, Susie Cooper had expected to meet Claudia at the Nag's Head near the house. That night was just a, a normal night. We'd arranged to meet like we always do. It always happened, um, I'd get to the pub first and then Claudia would just kind of walk in the door. Their friend, Jen King, was working behind the bar. It rolled around 10 o'clock and there's still no sign of her. I was worried because it was unlike her to, to just not turn up. Claudia was due at work at six o'clock the next morning as a chef in the university canteen. The next morning when I woke up and her phone it went to voicemail and that was when I knew something was wrong. Susie phoned up our local pub and spoke to the landlord there and asked him to go knock on Claudia's door. There was no answer. My feeling was just pure fear. Jen was calling hospitals. That's when Susie alerts Claudia's father, Peter. He drives from his home north of York. I was afraid we might just find Claudia lying on the floor. Her slippers were just inside the door, as they would be if she'd uh, popped her boots on that March morning uh, to go up to the university. And everything looked perfectly in order. The house was just as it w should be. Um, there was nothing weird. In the kitchen, unwashed breakfast crockery. I slipped upstairs just to have a quick look in the bedroom and uh, everything 
looked okay from there. I was worried enough to call the police. Two officers were round at the house within about five minutes and they were taking it very seriously. One of the officers went upstairs, I went with her, and there was a necklace lying on top of the chest of drawers. And I noticed that Claudia's handbag was hanging on the end of the bed. The officer found that she hadn't taken the driving licence, credit card, passport or anything else. But Claudia's chef's whites are missing. So is her mobile phone. So it looked to me as so though she'd probably just come off to work. Peter and Claudia's mother, Joan, separated 13 years before the disappearance. Joan was not immediately informed Claudia was gone. I think I should have been told and I would have gone straight away. Disbelief, shock, you think she's going to turn up, you think that this sort of thing happens to other people, not to you. Saturday, March the 21st, North Yorkshire Police launch a missing person appeal. The Claudia Lawrence case is one of the most difficult and indeed turbulent investigations that the North Yorkshire Police has ever had to carry out. Colin Sutton is a former senior investigating officer with the Metropolitan Police. North Yorkshire Police have taken a lot of criticism over the investigation, and I think partly for that and because it's still a live investigation, their reluctance to talk to the media about it. But two months in, with no breakthrough, the detective superintendent leading the inquiry did go on the BBC's Crime Watch programme to appeal for information. They interviewed Ray Galloway, who made uh, a comment which changed everything, changed everything for Claudia, for us, and for the way the whole investigation was going to go forward. And I just thought, shit, <laughs> this is not the way I wanted it to go at all. Tell us what it is you want to see. As the investigation has developed, it's apparent that some of Claudia's relationships had an element of complexity and mystery to them. I'm certain that some of those relationships were not known to a family or a friend. He uttered those words, complex and mysterious. And I think at that point, I didn't really realise, to be honest, what effect that was going to have. Unwittingly, the police remarks triggered a media feeding frenzy. Mike Laycock is chief reporter of the York Press. That really provoked a tidal wave of coverage about her personal life, about her relationships, particularly by tabloid newspapers. And from then on in, she was labelled as some kind of home wrecker and some kind of scarlet woman. And she was neither of those things. Her character was just ripped to pieces, people intimating that she deserved what had happened to her. They didn't see Claudia as a victim of a crime. It had such a catastrophic impact upon people's willingness to come forward to find a young girl that had gone missing. And it's crucial in these investigations that you keep the public on your side and you keep them interested. It's not just the general public. Amid the media firestorm, Information from people in Claudia's social circle dries up. Men in this area, they were frightened that they were going to be accused of having an affair or being in a relationship with Claudia when they hadn't. The whole thing blew this community apart completely. Well, the person they were speaking about was not my daughter. You need to bear in mind, North Yorkshire Police are a very small force. There are about 1,300 police officers. Compare that to, say, 30,000 in London. So these things come along and they don't get much exposure to them. They perhaps make decisions that they might not if they were more experienced. It did seem sometimes as if a mist had been created enveloping the police investigation that, that covered up the truth about what happened to Claudia. So what did happen to Claudia? Are there clues that she could still be alive? Policemen can have to pin down her movements to get the CCTV images. Or does evidence point to murder? My theory has always been that she was picked up en route by someone that at least she recognised.
Claudia Lawrence disappeared in 2009, aged 35. It was a very, probably a healthy um, upbringing when they, they were outdoors a lot. Claudia and her older sister, Ali, live with Mum Joan and Dad Peter in Moulton, 18 miles from York. He was a partner at a solicitor's firm. Her one love, if you like, was, uh, was horses and ponies. She had a pony of her own from a very early age. She was fine, just very normal. She had riding lessons every Saturday. They were dog mad, horse mad. She was shy. She was certainly camera shy, so there's very few photographs of Claudia around. Older sister, Ali, was more academic, but Claudia was more adventurous, which uh, resulted in a few trips to our local cottage hospital. After leaving school, Claudia went to catering college. Working with Claudia in the canteen was chef David Oxer. She got on with her work. She kept cell to cell, wasn't really bothered in other people's gossip. There was the usual banter in the kitchen. He's a bit, bit quicker doing this, so she prepped a carrot, doing it the right thickness. <laughs> Stuff like that, really. I think her main interest in it was her social life with her friends. She liked to enjoy herself after work. Jen King and Susie Cooper met Claudia when she moved to York in her 30s at the Nags Head. She was just hilarious, and I just remember thinking that she was just so funny. Yeah. <laughs> that stupid little voice that she would yeah. adopt, but... <laughs> but it was nice to, to get to know the lovely person that she was and is. I don't think you should apologise or, or change when you say was or is, because I think... It is both, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. we can speak about her in the past tense because we haven't seen her for 10 years, but she still is as well, because as far as we know, you know, she is still a, around. Mm -hmm. we, we were both single. We kind of hit it off straight away. I'd never, never had a friend like Claudia before. Mm -hmm. I've not, never really been very good at making friends anyway, but I think that Claudia just kind of got me and didn't judge me and accepted me. She just said, we're spinster sisters. So this is the card that Claudia left me at my front door with a bunch of flowers when I was feeling poorly. Uh, it just says, uh, to sister, hope you're feeling better soon. Love you lots, sister. She's the sort of friend I always wanted and she's the sort of friend that I eventually found. In 2007, Jen moved in with Claudia at the house where she was living when she went missing, just down from the Nags Head in Hewitt. The three of us tended to go to the Nags. It was just convenient for us. We knew all of the customers in there and everyone was just so lovely. When Claudia went missing in March 2009, it was obviously a possibility that she'd been harmed by somebody, so the police had to look at her romantic relationships as well as her other social life. And the starting point for that was the centre of her social life, really. It was the Nags Head pub. For the pub to be focused on and us to be focused on by the police has been quite, quite a shock, really. People in the pub started to get a bit pissed off, let's say, by the amount of times the police wanted to talk to them. Nags Head seemed to be quite a close-knit community. Police believed that people were keeping information back from them. In June 2009, the negative image around Claudia is reinforced when a woman tells a national paper Claudia had an affair with her husband, ending the marriage. 
That episode, together with other relationships that Claudia had had, meant that police had to explore these, you know, less than savoury lines of inquiry. She was a beautiful 35-year-old single woman with no children, no ties, no, not even a pet to worry about. So I think it would be strange if she didn't go out and meet men for drinks or dates. She was quite entitled to do that. This really is a huge investigation, and all the time they're trying to find out, is Claudia missing or is she murdered? They're researching to see if she's still alive. Has she gone somewhere off on her, of her own accord? Claudia had considered moving abroad to Cyprus. We went away there and our friend moved over there and that's why we, we went to visit him for a holiday. When we went out there, there was a restauranteur that offered her a job every night. She always had one toe in the market. It became obvious to the police Claudia was a woman who had lots of friends throughout the UK and even abroad, particularly in Cyprus. So they knew they were going to have to pin down an hour-by-hour -hour picture of what happened leading up to the time when she was reported missing. One witness, who's never previously spoken to the media, has key evidence about Monday the 16th, two nights before Claudia was last seen. A year after the disappearance, David Oxer, her co-worker, remembered something she'd said about that night. The Tuesday, she looked a bit worse aware. And I said to her, you look, a bit, you look a bit rough this morning, this morning. And she says, yeah. And I said, so, no, you get no sleep last night? She said, no, not a lot. She informed me, yeah, she'd been out and she was being with a male friend the evening and uh, things progressed. Police believe Claudia had a casual boyfriend at the time she disappeared, but that the man spoken about to David Oxer was someone else. Clearly, this man is somebody the police would really like to have spoken to. He's never come forward. Wednesday, the 18th of March, 2009, the last day Claudia has seen alive. She walks the 2.3 miles to work because her car is at a garage for service. At half past two, she sets off for home again, tracked by CCTV. Peter helped confirm to police it's Claudia in the footage. Well, that's uh, Claudia just walking out of her place of work at the university with a little rucksack on. The next CCTV sighting, police say, shows Claudia outside Melrose Gate Post Office at 2.50 p.m. On the journey between university and her home on Heweth Road, she's about halfway. And someone who looks very much like Claudia has just posted a letter and carried on walking up towards Heweth. There have been extensive inquiries by the police, but we still don't know what was in that envelope or to whom was it addressed? Claudia is seen again, nearer her house. A local childminder who knew Claudia from the next head saw her walking past her about 10 past three and said that she shouted to her and waved enthusiastically and Claudia just seemed her usual cheerful, happy self. But four hours later, at 7.15 p.m., a figure is captured on CCTV turning into a junction yards from Claudia's house. And then a minute later, he's back and he's got a bag over his shoulder. Somebody's coming along and you see him stop as if I don't want to bump into him, I don't want him to see me. And he lets this person go past and then he goes out and turns towards Claudia's house. It looks suspicious, it's odd behavior. Why did he not want to come across that person on the main road? As those images are being recorded, it seems Claudia is passing a normal evening. At 7.27 p.m., she speaks to Peter. He offers to lend her his car to get to work. She says she'll walk. She seemed perfectly happy with uh, things. At 8.04 p.m., Claudia speaks to her mum, as she does daily. 
she seemed normal, she was going to bed, she was going to be in bed by nine because she, um, that's what she did when she had an early start. The last text sent to Claudia's phone that night is from a friend in Paphos on Cyprus. It arrives at 12 minutes past nine. Claudia never read or opened that message. It's not known at what time Claudia actually goes missing. That night? The following morning? Police do believe that the most likely explanation for Claudia's disappearance is that she was abducted while walking to work that morning by a man who she knew. If somebody that she didn't know had stopped and offered a lift, there is no chance, not one chance at all in my mind that she would have got in. My theory has always been that she was picked up en route by someone that at least she recognised. What the police try to do is piece together, second by second almost, that journey to work. And you're looking for something out of the ordinary because adult women early in the morning walking to work very, very rarely get abducted. Coming up, are there clues Claudia wanted to go missing? Claudia's phone was deliberately switched off. Could it have been Claudia herself? Or is it murder? Please start making arrests. We just wanted them to rip off the bandage and just get on with it. Thursday, the 19th of March, 2009. Claudia Lawrence is due at work at 6 a.m. She has over two miles to walk to the university canteen. She'd have needed to set off shortly after five. Whilst their image was caught on CCTV walking home the previous evening, this morning, there's none. But other people are seen. 5.07 a.m. This piece of CCTV is from the same camera as the one the night before, near Hewitt Place. Police believe this could be 57-year-old local property landlord Richard Cartwright. Difficulty is, just three weeks later, on the 9th of April, Richard Cartwright died of natural causes. Police could never really fully eliminate him from their inquiries, but some of his friends have said, well, he, he was a conscientious man who used to get up early and go out and maintain his properties, and so he would have had every lawful reason to be about at that time of the morning. Claudia's father, Peter, scrutinizes the next CCTV clip, 5.42 a.m. So this is clearly Hewitt's road, and the car goes down, appears to break. Now, why would it suddenly break? Was there something going on? Did the driver stop and pick up Claudia? That car was never traced. Claudia did sometimes get a lift from her fellow chef, David Oxer. But that Thursday, having made no arrangement to pick her up, David drives past her road. Thought to myself, should I drive past her house and as she's walking down, I could have given her a lift the rest of the way. But for some reason, I'd, I carried on and I went down a different route. Part of me just wondered what had happened if I'd have gone up, if I'd turned left instead of carrying on. That was like a a monkey on my back for a, a few few days, a few weeks. The what ifs. I even offered her taxi money to get a taxi to work and walk back, and she wouldn't take it. But I, I, I wish she had done. Police chart the route most likely to have been used by Claudia. Along it, several potential sightings. This is Morrow's Gate Bridge, which is just about half a mile from where Claudia lived, down the road there. At about 5.35 in the morning, there was a cyclist who saw where I'm standing now, a man and a woman standing talking. The man is thin, similar height to the woman, in dark hoodie and combat trousers, and smoking with his left hand. A search of Claudia's car turns up a cigarette butt. Please find male DNA. It did make them think back to the sighting here on Melrose Gate Bridge, but all efforts to find him 
have failed. Also on Melrose Gate, another potentially significant sighting, either that morning or the previous day. Mike Laycock is a journalist at the York Press. All them contacted my newspaper to say uh, that a jogger had uh, been accosted by a man in a rusty white van um, on the Wednesday or the Thursday morning in Melrose Gate. That incident gained significance from a CCTV image captured by a bus just across the road from Claudia's house between one minute past nine and half past, the night she was last seen, a parked white Astro van. It was there for around about 30 minutes. Now, nobody ever came forward to say that that was their van and to say what they were doing there. University Road, 6.10 a.m. on the Thursday, a few minutes after Claudia is due at work. A man and a woman were seen here on the pavement standing next to a car. The passenger door of the car was open and they appeared to be arguing. So police made appeals but with no results, so we still don't know who that was that was spotted. In the canteen at the university, no sign of Claudia. 10 a.m. The manager rings Claudia's mobile. No answer. Mobile cell data locates the phone within an area northwest of York. That cell site extended for around about nine miles from the mast at the University of York in a, a, a sector that also included Claudia's home address. But Claudia's phone was not found at her home. 12.08, Claudia's phone was deliberately switched off. Now, the phone network knows whether a phone has been deliberately switched off using the button. Now, the question is, who switched Claudia's phone off? Was it an abductor? At one o'clock that day, a rucksack matching Claudia's is spotted by someone walking to York past the university. This is a path Claudia might have used on her way to work. The Carrie Moore rucksack was seen here lying on the grass. It had gone by the time police came here. It was never retrieved. At the York Press, they had to decide how big to run the Claudia story. On the Sunday afternoon, I was in charge of the news desk and we had a story lined up for the front page about a murder. But a press release came in about Claudia being missing and it seemed a really exceptional case. Uh, the police said it was out of character. Her parents issued a very emotional plea for her return. So the editor decided that would be the splash for the Monday. The whole thing was obviously extremely upsetting, worrying. Uh, what on earth could have happened to Claudia? North York's police launched one of the biggest investigations in their history. There were more than 100 officers involved, 70 volunteers, police reinforcements brought in from surrounding forces, sniffer dogs, fingertip searches taking place. Very time consuming, very expensive, very resource intensive searches. Police searched for Claudia for a month, but with no sign. On April the 24th, the man leading the inquiry declares they're treating the case as murder. That's when we agreed that uh, we would work on parallel lines with both trying to find out the same thing, but him thinking it's murder, me thinking she's missing. The nag's head is searched by officers with a dog trained to sniff out human remains. A bed sheet with a blood spot is taken for analysis. That was in the press is like, oh my God, they found blood in the next head. That could have been anything, you know, various people stay there. DNA tests on the blood are inconclusive. Claudia's phone records are analyzed. One area of York becomes a particular focus of investigation. It was clear that she'd been spending a lot of time here in Acom in the weeks leading up to her disappearance. There were, at one stage, even a request for taxi drivers who might have taken Claudia over to Aiken to get in touch uh, with the police. So within just a couple of months, over a 1,000 witness statements had been taken, 240 different properties searched, and everything drew a blank. With dwindling leads and costs running at over three quarters of a million pounds, the following summer, the inquiry is scaled down from 100 officers to 16, then seven. 
it's actually understandable. You can't keep a team of officers there waiting for someone to ring up or come in with information. I mean, it's, you just can't. No progress really had been made, and the investigation really was stalling. But then in 2013, police announced a new major crime unit in Harrogate will review the case. It was a good feeling that you had very experienced officers going over the whole thing again. After re-evaluating original evidence, a car is seized, houses are searched, a pub in Acom has its cellar dug up. Finally, in 2014, an arrest on suspicion of murder, a home searched, a man released, another arrest for perverting the course of justice, a man never charged. Then in 2015, a further arrest on suspicion of murder. We can't give names for legal reasons. When the first arrest of 2015 was made, it was clear that there was a storm coming. It was like, we just wanted them to rip off the bandage and just get on with it. After advanced analysis of CCTV and DNA, four arrests on suspicion of murder, a file sent to the Crown Prosecution Service, but still no conclusive proof, still no body. The CPS decided that there wasn't sufficient evidence and so the men were released from their bail. Coming up, could Claudia have met a notorious serial killer? Previous serial killers are brought into stories like, oh, it could be them. And then you start thinking, could it be? Or could she have been sex trafficked to Amsterdam? I had heard that there was some sort of white slave trade going on. How could a 35-year-old woman vanish into thin air without trace for 10 years? The last text sent to Claudia Lawrence's phone before she disappeared in March 2009 was from a male friend in Cyprus. Two years earlier, she'd visited Coral Bay with her friend, Jen King. I just can't understand why she never moved abroad. She loved being away, she loved heat, loved having a tan. She particularly had a love for Cyprus. One theory that was investigated was that Claudia had done a moonlight flip, that she'd left home of her own accord and perhaps moved to Cyprus. Four UK police officers descend on Coral Bay. People start asking uh, if she's here or not. It was a big thing. At the time, Tim Ephthemios is running five venues locally. Everybody they were wondering, uh, especially in the Coral Bay Strip, uh, where she is. Please speak to a friend of Claudia's who splits his time between Coral Bay and the UK. Tony Theo, owner of Chalky's Bar, knows the man. Yeah, he's uh, a really big character. He works in one of the local bars. At the time, the man regularly drives a van between the UK and Cyprus. And one of the theories going around was that possibly she'd uh, left the UK in a van and been brought across to Cyprus, uh, smuggled into the country. Police speculate at the time this could explain how Claudia might be abroad, despite having left her passport behind. To get someone from the UK to Cyprus in a van, you've got to go through a number of custom points, there'll be checks. Would she have got found out on the way through? Would she have lasted in the back of a van for that period of time? Probably unlikely. Claudia had spoken of finding work in Cyprus. She would make friends with bar staff and with uh, restaurant staff, and she would stay in touch with them as well and was quite often offered jobs to go work abroad. When she was younger, she was very much involved with horses, had her own ponies, etc. And she'd asked, specifically asked the guy that we were talking about previously if he could find us some work with horses over here, uh, maybe in the stables or in a livery or something like that. When questioned, the van driver denies involvement in Claudia's disappearance. Please check out his story. He's in the clear. They interview several witnesses. If she came back here after her disappearance, somebody would have recognised her, but no one's seen her, no one, no one spoke to her. It's highly likely that she never did. She wouldn't just up sticks and leave without telling anyone. She would have been 
mega excited about it and worrying about it. She just wouldn't go just like that. But in July 2012, the smuggling theory gains new traction. Police learn a private detective claims to have seen Claudia in Amsterdam. Colin Sutton is a former senior police officer. Some have suggested because of Amsterdam's connections with uh, the sex trade that this is supportive of the notion that she was uh, sex trafficked across to Amsterdam. I guess sex trafficking did come up in my mind as a possibility. Although Claudia's 35 when she went missing, I think it's usually young girls that get trafficked. Claudia's mother, Joan, has also speculated about sex trafficking. I had heard that there was some sort of white slave trade going on. But how could Claudia have journeyed to Holland with no passport? During the making of this film, Joan revealed for the first time a potential sighting which opens a new possibility. There was this gentleman from York who had gone to live at Hartlepool, contacted me, he was convinced he saw Claudia down by the marina. He recognised her from living in York. This gentleman told me there were boats going to Amsterdam daily from Hartlepool and she could have been on one of them. So could Claudia be leading a new life overseas? Dutch police check out the Amsterdam story, but there's no trace of Claudia. I'm absolutely convinced that she didn't disappear off to Cyprus or anywhere else. She was not a mastermind or a master criminal who would have been able to devise a way of going abroad from not using a bank account or a passport or anything else. One last theory. Was Claudia a victim of a serial killer? Christopher Halliwell, a Swindon taxi driver, was jailed in 2012 for two murders. If I can clear this up, in the next few hours, will everything else be forgotten? A witness reports seeing Claudia near Claudia's home in 2009, talking to a man matching Halliwell's description. This man had tried to lure her. She said she will never, ever forget his eyes. She got such a clear view of him. She knew who he was when she saw his photograph on television and in the papers. So could Claudia have met him? The police officer who was responsible for Halliwell's conviction looked at it and said that he thought it was a possibility, pointing out that he had family connections in Yorkshire. I think it is credible, yes. But. There were problems with it because Halliwell had some connections in Yorkshire. Yes, he did, but they were in Huddersfield, which is uh, you know, a considerable distance away from York. Peter is on his way to Bishopthorpe Palace, private residence of the Archbishop of York. Archbishop John Centermoon has kept Claudia's photo and a candle in the chapel since she disappeared. Oh, hello, Peter. Hello, John. Well, welcome. Thank welcome you. Welcome again. Nice to see you. Thank you. Come in, please. Thank Come you. in. God of invisible love and power, our hearts still ache. In your mercy, take our grief and take away our waiting. But above all, Lord, speak to someone who knows where she is. May this light burn all the darkness. So, Lord, in your mercy, graciously hear us. I hear our prayer. Amen. Amen. Someone knows what happened. Yeah, and knows where she is. It's not yes. just happened, knows where yes. she is. And I just pray for courage that they will, through this program, they will be able to have their conscience really pricked. 
to come forward. Yeah. Thank you, John. Claudia's disappearance leaves a legacy, a change in the law, due to Peter's persistence. It was only a few weeks after Claudia had disappeared that I realised that you can't do anything with the financial and property affairs of any adult who's missing. And I thought, I'm a solicitor, I'm missing something. He campaigned successfully for relatives to be allowed to manage a missing person's estate. I went to every debate in Parliament. And it was really pleasing to hear the minister say, this act will always be known as Claudia's Law. It was really good to hear. The police investigation is now in a reactive phase with no action till there's fresh evidence. But the impact of Claudia's disappearance... just so slim as to be um, impossible. But Peter believes she may be being held captive. You've got to have...